Okay, but I think colleagues, we are ready to start. So uh, warm welcome, as we always say, good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are, because we have colleagues from all regions, from Malaysia to even Americas, uh, uh, Europe, uh, colleagues from um, Africa and of course Asia. So it's great to see you online. This is our monthly peer to peer exchange webinar. So if there are some colleagues who are joining for the first time, this is really an opportunity to exchange around a topic in a very informal way to brainstorm about it, to ask questions, um, share practices, examples. It's an opportunity to pause a little bit in the day to day work, see what are maybe some new additional ways how to engage on the human rights front, how to use effectively human rights mechanisms and strengthen our human rights engagement. So today we are focusing on collaboration with the working group on arbitrary detention. So one of the uh, special procedures mandates, uh, um, as you know, they are um, over 50 special procedures mandates, uh, most of them thematic ones, and this is an important mandate for UNHCR and any entity working in displacement context because unfortunately arbitrary detention is really touching on all of the contexts in which we are working in the context of uh, displacement as well as statelessness, of course. So, um, Today's webinar will be actually composed. Uh, uh, if we can go to the next slide, uh, please. Yes, ground rules colleagues, uh, you know them very well already. We have maximum one hour and a half together. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. We will also share a brief summary with you afterwards. Um, if you can keep your microphone on mute, but on the contrary, we invite you to very actively use the chat and I cannot stress this enough because those peer exchanges are also an opportunity for you to connect between you. Maybe you hear that uh, Zahra or Mari uh, is uh, mentioning an example or um, is giving, uh, providing a good practice that you are interested in and is related to your also operation. So you can reach out to them afterwards and take it as an opportunity to build your networks of colleagues and uh, expand this um, champions network on human rights engagement. So please use the chat actively. We will We'll be constantly monitoring it and bringing back then the questions to the panelists. And speaking about panelists, if we can go to the next slide, we have three colleagues with us today. Margarita Nechaeva, Francisco Alfonso and Loana Benjamin. You see them on the camera. Uh, they are with us today and they are supporting the work of the working group on arbitrary detention. So, Today the program is that Margarita, Francisco and Luana will uh, share with us some insight about the mandate and the functioning of the working group on arbitrary detention so that we are all on the same page. I'm sure that everybody on the call will learn something new about uh, the working group on arbitrary detention. What are its functions, some examples, uh, how it can be useful for us. And then we will also, and above all, uh, have an exchange. So you can ask questions how this can be practically used in your operation. If you have any uh, clarification, uh, need of clarification for some of the aspects, how this uh, can be started in practice and so on. So the objective of today's event is that Uh, we have a good understanding about how the working group on arbitrary detention works, what is its mandate, um, what it covers, but also, and very importantly, how we can use it more strategically in the context of uh, displacement. So how we can link some of our work, protection work, advocacy work, etc to um, better use of uh, the working group of arbitrary detention. Very good. So I think um, I will stop here already 
so that we have enough time for presentation and discussion. Thanks to all colleagues who are posting in the chat your introduction. So please, colleagues, uh, do introduce yourself in the chat. It's fantastic to see that we have colleagues from Tehran to Morocco to Congo Brazzaville, DRC Congo, as well as Mozambique, Burkina Faso, uh, Rwanda, Italy, uh, Iran, Mogadishu, Somalia, Thailand, Chad. That's fantastic, colleagues. So we really see here that uh, this is a cross-cutting uh, topic if we can mute uh, everybody. Um, uh, it's a cross-cutting topic relevant to all operations, all regions of course, and with that I give the floor to Margarita to get us started on the presentation on a working group on arbitrary detention. So over to you Margarita please. Hello, Hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to uh, exchange um, with such a wide range of uh, colleagues and partners from around uh, the world. We're really uh, grateful for this opportunity and hope that um, greater collaboration and yet more uh, cooperation will come out of our exchange. Um, so I will uh, start uh, quickly presenting the mandate and then pass the floor to, to my colleagues to explain a little bit more the core function of the mandate and then I'll close with uh, the questions that were flagged to me as of particular interest uh, to, to your field of practice. So um, just um, if uh, Peter, if we could uh, change the slide. Thank you. So uh, to quickly give you a background, the working group has been established some 30 years ago. In fact, this year we will uh, be celebrating the 30th uh, anniversary of the establishment of the working group. Um, it's been established by the then uh, Human Rights Commission following the relevant study on the uh, arbitrary detention uh, and the resolution has um, established a very um, a particular uh, human rights mechanism at the time um, mandating um, mandating five independent experts um, from five different regional groups to um, to look into uh, specific cases of alleged uh, arbitrary detention. That is uh, the detentions that are alleged to be contrary to uh, international law, uh, uh, relevant treaties, uh, universal declaration of human rights, and uh, perhaps also some uh, soft law that's been developing uh, over the decades. So, um, the um, when analyzing uh, the um, as I as I mentioned, could we could we go to another slide? Thank you. So yes, as I mentioned, that the uh, working group would be composed of uh, five independent experts, uh, and uh, the resolution would mandate the mechanism to uh, function for three uh, years at a time. So as you can imagine, it's been reviewed many uh, renewed many times by. Uh, Human Rights Council uh, now. Next. Um, yes, so um, the working group in uh, discharging its mandate uh, would uh, take the information from all uh, sources possible, including the governments, uh, non governmental partners, in concerned individuals, um, families, uh, legal uh, practitioners, uh, and uh, UN partners, of course. And uh, of course, it will uh, aim at um, um, its discharging its mandate with discretion, objectivity, and independence. And in that, uh, I would uh, mention that when um, reviewing a case from a particular country, if uh, this country coincides with the nationality of the expert, that expert would abstain from uh, the discussion of the case, and this uh, would be recorded in the official uh, opinion of the working group afterwards. Uh, next, please. So uh, when analyzing uh, uh, a case on alleged arbitrary detention, deprivation of liberty, the working group would guide itself by both treaties and um, the so-called soft law. And uh, when we 
come to treaties, of course, that would be Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in particular the Article 3 on Right to Life, uh, Article 9, 10, 11, the uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, and uh, more specifically Articles 9, 10, 11 and 14. Um, also the Convention, of course, relating to the status of refugees of 51. Um, a convention on Elimination of All Kinds of uh, Racial Discrimination, Convention on the Right of the Child, Convention Against Torture, uh, International Convention on the Protection of Migrant Workers and Their Families, and the Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities. If you would refer uh, to the uh, jurisprudence of the working group across the years, you will see the reference to all these uh, treaties in uh, its dispositions. Next, please. And uh, when it comes to the soft law, uh, these are just the examples of uh, the bodies of principles and the standards that the working group would also refer to in uh, deliberating uh, a particular case. So just to name a few, there are Nelson Mandela rules that figure prominently, the body of principles for protection of all persons um, under any form of detention or imprisonment, the Beijing rules on the administration of juvenile justice, the Bangkok rules on the treatment of women prisoners and so on. Next, please. So uh, I would like to focus a little bit more on this slide, which uh, um, gives you a, a broad overview of the mandate of the working group. So how does uh, actually the working group look into the um, these allegations of uh, arbitrary deprivation of liberty? First and foremost, uh, this is the I would say a core function of uh, of our mandate and the function that is a unique to all special procedures mandate is the uh, regular communication procedure. Uh, this procedure mm, is um, actually so called we can say an investigation on individual uh, case that would involve um, communication with the government and the alleged victim or their representative, and then it would lead to the uh, adoption of the official opinion, that is uh, the um, UN uh, official document, uh, determining whether this uh, case is uh, contrary to international law or not. That is the uh, core function that, as I said, it's a very uh, unique uh, instrument and uh, my colleagues would elaborate a little bit more in detail uh, on how to use it uh, later on. Uh, the second um, way uh, and mechanism of the working group would be the urgent appeals and allegation letters. These are the um, instruments that are used across all special procedures and uh, in my recollection when uh, we would um, come across a case of um, um, particular concern in the context of migration, the working group would, would likely be joining uh, an urgent appeal, an allegation letter that would be led, for example, by the special rapporteur on the rights of migrants, for example. That not We would not necessarily um, uh, initiate, although the working group can also initiate uh, this uh, uh, this mechanism, but because uh, we, we, we have a very um, unique uh, instrument that could benefit potential uh, victims uh, in, uh, in terms of um, the regular communication procedure, we would support other mandates in urgent appeals and allegation letters. The third uh, mechanism at the disposition of the working group are the country visits. Uh, the working group usually conducts uh, two country visits per year. These are uh, conducted by uh, about three experts of the working group, depending on their availability. And these uh, visits are always conducted at the official invitation of the host government. So um, I would like uh, to just uh, in brackets, pause here a little bit and uh, say that um, in uh, when we have um, you know a specific country visit in mind, when it's all the dates being set, we would usually uh, reach out to our UN partners and to the civil society with a for with a call for inputs 
that would then feed into the country assessment. And um, we have had a very fruitful collaboration with uh, UNHCR in uh, on a number of country visits before. And, uh, and also with the civil society. And in fact, I think the inputs that we have received from, uh, from both uh, civil society and uh, UNHCR has been pivotal in, in terms of the uh, gaining a greater understanding of the migration um, context uh, in that particular country. So, um, and of course, uh, when the working group is actually on the ground conducting the visit, it would uh, meet uh, the UN partners on the ground and uh, it would also conduct a quite um, extensive uh, meeting with the civil society that would be confidential and of course out of bounds for any governmental um, representative. Um, then uh, I would mention that the working group, uh, of course, uh, has a, a part of um, thematic part in its annual reports uh, and uh, when uh, it decides to to dedicate a specific um, specific uh, issue uh, in its annual report it would also uh, call for for inputs uh, from from the concerned entities um, or in fact the working group can also lead the study on a specific subject right now uh, the working group uh, has just conducted a study on the um, drugs in uh, the context of uh, detention and so um, uh, right now the working group has no immediate plans for this year to conduct another study, but as soon as you know this plan is made, uh, the working group again reaches uh, its partners, relevant partners, in order to seek inputs. And uh, finally, uh, the working group uh, conducts uh, studies on um, deliberate and adopt deliberations, which are a position of principles based on consistent set of uh, practice on uh, uh, matters of general nature. And in this uh, context, I would invite you to consult the working group's deliberation number five. I know that Valerie has already mentioned it in the concept note of our peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange, but I would invite you to consult the, this deliberation number five, which, which, cons which concerns specifically um, the deprivation of liberty in the context of migration. In the later slides, you will see the uh, hyperlink to, to this deliberation. That might be useful. So Thank next, you so much, Margarita. At the meantime, I just because I'm receiving messages, colleagues, we will share with you the presentation. I may ask also Peter to share it in the chat so that uh, you can see all the links. And also maybe Peter, if you can post the, the fact sheets or the background note about the mandate. So colleagues, you don't need to worry. You will have all the materials with you. And over to you, Margarita. Sure. So the final point I would mention is that uh, you will also see the uh, link to the working group's methods of work, which could be a useful reference in understanding in detail all the proceedings that my colleagues will later elaborate. And finally, I'd like to conclude my part of uh, intervention when, uh, in explain a little bit um, uh, when the working group really uh, would consider that the deprivation of liberty is in fact arbitrary. Uh, the mandate has five legal categories to, to refer to. First uh, would be when it finds no legal basis justifying the, the detention. And just to give you an example, that could be when, for example, the person has served his or her sentence and is, remains in detention, or, for example, when there has been no uh, arrest warrant presented at the um, at the time of the arrest and the arrest has not been conducted in accordance with with the international standard or for example when uh, the um, the national legislation is completely at odds with uh, with the international standards the second category would be um, the detention resulting from the exercise of rights and freedoms guaranteed by the Universal Declaration and the Covenant. And I would like to stress in this context the Article 14 of the Universal Declaration on the right to seek asylum and the Article 12 of the Covenant on the right to leave any country. The Category 3 
uh, of uh, arbitrariness would be when uh, all the rights to fair trial or some partially would be uh, disrespected. That that is, uh, for example, when um, a person or a migrant in uh, in the context of uh, administrative detention uh, would have no uh, access to legal legal uh, representative, for example, or when there would be no uh, possibility of interpretation when the migrant does not understand uh, the language he or she is being addressed at and is forced to undergo the proceedings in the language without the, uh, the assistance. Uh, fourth category, I think that's uh, really the category of, uh, of the interest uh, um, of our current exchange is a category four. Uh, when asylum seekers, immigrants or refugees are subjected to prolonged administrative custody without the possibility of uh, review or remedy. So I think that's uh, the category four that we would um, maybe elaborate a little bit later on and um, you would also find in this presentation some uh, links to the relevant jurisprudence that you could consult. And finally category five which can be linked to <laughs> category four as well as to other categories is when the um, uh, detention is based on discrimination on discriminatory grounds. So with this, I would um, end my part and I'll pass the floor to my colleague Luana and Francisco, who would explain you a little bit more on how our core function of our mandate works and how we can um, work together um, with this. Um, Luana, over to you. Thank you very much, Margarita, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, so first of all, I'll be discussing the criteria that the working group will look at uh, to decide whether or not it should intervene um, on a case. Um, the first one is very important. It's one of the most important. It's the consent. So we won't act. We will come back on this a little uh, later and I'll give more details about that. But preliminary. We won't act without the consent of the petitioner um, and the consent may be given by uh, the victim themselves or a member of their family or their legal representative. We also look at the urgency of the case, um, the vulnerability of the alleged victim. Um, and so, for example, in cases where the person may be facing, uh, this is just to give a few examples, but in cases where the person may be facing um, death penalty or where there's grave concerns about their health, this might uh, um, prompt us to act uh, because of the vulnerability of the victim. We also look at the quality of the information, I'm sorry, would you like me to wait for the uh, presentation? I'm not sure if everyone can follow um, the presentation. Okay, thank you. So um, the one of the other criteria is the quality of the information provided. Um, so we look at the kind of facts that are provided, the uh, information, the legal analysis, the kind of allegations that are made in the submission. We also will look at the reliability of the source. So uh, generally, when we get a submission, if we are missing some information, if some things aren't clear, we will go back to the source. But we'll also make sure that the source is able to provide us concrete information and individualized information. So we may be wary about cases where the information is scarce or where the information is mostly based on uh, is mostly based on media um, in sources. Uh, we also look at the credibility of the information that we receive. We rely on objective, dependable facts. So we look at uh, how much facts are given to us. Um, we in choosing the cases that we uh, will take, because we receive a large number of submissions, we try to ensure a geographic distribution. 
So we'll try to represent, uh, to have multiple countries, multiple regions represented. So we don't take uh, cases from only, for example, only Asia or from, from uh, mostly one country. We try to have a good geographic distribution. Um, and there is no requirement uh, that the person, that the victim or the alleged victim exhaust domestic remedies. Uh, in fact, in some cases, petitioners will intentionally decide not to pursue domestic remedies because either they don't believe in the impartiality of the system or they fear reprisals. So there is no requirement that uh, domestic remedies be exhausted. And there's no, um, there's no requirement either that states ratify international human rights instruments. Uh, the working group has found that uh, the prohibition of arbitrary uh, detention applies to all states, regardless of uh, the treaties that they have ratified. We use various instruments of uh, law, as Margarita has pointed out. We look at customary law, we look at um, use Kogan's norms, uh, so there is no need for uh, the states to have ratified in, uh, certain instruments. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in regards to who can submit a case, uh, really mostly anybody. So we can have cases from uh, the person detained themselves. We sometimes get cases from family members. Uh, we often get cases from their legal representative. We also work with uh, government in and out, intergovernmental organizations. Law firms submit cases, non-governmental organizations. We also work with uh, national human rights institutions. And of course, the working group itself uh, may choose to um, take up a case. Uh, and uh, as I'll come back to later, the, um, the confidentiality of the source is always kept, so we will never divulge uh, information about who submits the case for safety purposes and privacy purposes, of course. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, I'll go a little bit into how to submit a case. Um, so you can find on the first link the complete to the, um, the link to which the completed questionnaires and the signed consent forms should be sent to. So this is our uh, generic uh, email address. Uh, and those forms, so the questionnaire and the consent form can be found at the second, um, the second link on the slide. And this link con uh, contains consent forms and questionnaires in all three languages that the working group works in. So that's English, French, and Spanish. Um, in addition to the questionnaire, which um, I like to mention that we don't require that sources use that questionnaire. We encourage them to use it, but sources submit sometimes their own submissions. Uh, the questionnaire, however, gives a very good idea about uh, what kind of information the working group will look at. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in addition to the questionnaire, uh, the sources may provide supporting documents or evidence. However, there is a requirement in the working group's methods of work that submissions be 20 pages or less. So anything above 20 pages may not be considered by the working group. And this requirement applies to both the submissions from the sources, as well as the government's reply. So the government's reply also is required to be under or 20 pages at the maximum. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in the um, submission, what we like to find is an analysis of the alleged violation. So in addition to uh, the fact if you look at the questionnaire, this is a very, you can see this very clearly. There's a part about the facts. We ask, uh, for example, where the person was detained, the circumstances of the detention, but there's also an analysis part where we ask that the sources um, include uh, an analysis of the alleged violation regarding uh, fair trial norms. So whether, for 
instance a person was informed about the charges, whether there was a warrant for their arrest, uh, allegations about um, the uh, respect for or non-respect of um, the right to access a lawyer, uh, whether there was a possibility to review the detention, whether the person was brought before a judge. So those are all um, allegations related to fair trial rights, particularly uh, concerning Article 9 of the Universal Declaration, Article 10, and Article 9 and 14 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. In the cases of asylum seekers, migrants, and refugees, uh, there is a right for every migrant um, or every detained person in this context to have their detention reviewed. And so um, the submission should include an analysis of uh, violations on, in that regard. So for instance, whether um, the person was able to effect effectively challenge their detention, whether their detention was periodically reviewed when it, as it extends in time, um, whether the, the detention was uh, necessary and proportionate. And of course, in both uh, cases of administrative detention, but also criminal detention, uh, there may, the source may want to include um, an, an analysis of whether the detention was based on discriminatory grounds um, and again, this applies for administrative detention as well. Um, and uh, that, sorry, next slide please, that's it for that. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is the question of consent that I was referring to earlier. Um, because the UN does not have a means to ensure the safety of persons, on, uh, of persons that uh, are the subject of submissions, and because there are fears of reprisals in certain cases, we will not act unless we have specific consent from uh, the person. And again, this consent um, is uh, may be given by a family member or the legal representative, as well as, of course, the petitioner themselves. The consent is uh, in to, it concerns three different uh, things. So the first part of the consent is whether the person will agree to have their name in a communication to the government. Um, and this may become clear as we explain uh, the process of submitting communications to the government and adopting opinion. Um, the second part of the consent is whether the person agrees to their name being published in the, in the opinion, because the opinion will be pu made public on the working group's website. And the third part is whether the person agrees to their name being uh, made public in an annual report and the report to the Human Rights Council. Of course, in some cases, we may not uh, we may not include the name of the person. So, if there are protection concerns, and especially in cases of minors, we will not include the name of the minor. And as I said earlier, for uh, privacy and security purposes, the identity of the source will will never be re re sorry will never be revealed. Next slide, please. Oh. I think I will give the floor to Francisco now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And Francisco, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Loana. Th thank you also, Valerie and, and colleagues, colleagues at UNHCR for having us again. And, and thank you all for, for being here and having an interest in the, in the working group. Um, I'm going to take the discussion now um, to the procedure of the working group in which it considers these individual cases and how it develops and what happens after it has decided that a detention is arbitrary and how it reaches that decision, etc. So um, we're going to um, continue exploring how, how, how we work here in, in, and, and how you can use this uh, for the protection of, of the victims that, that you work with. Um, so after after receiving after receiving a, a case amongst the many that, that that the working groups received and and analyzing the the elements present there the, the geographical balance the, the risk etc uh, also um, 
the, 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 the formal requirements such as the consent, etc., that, that my colleagues already explained. Um, the working group will will here prepare a summary of the case, uh, a, a small report about about the allegations of of, of, of arbitrary detention and and the factual um, elements that were presented to it, and it will transmit to this this small report, this summary to the government, uh, to give to the government an opportunity to to provide its side of the story in a way, its defense, its views as to why this person is detained um, and, and the reasons why uh, it, the, the agents of the, the state has, have taken this course of action and how is this in conformity of not with international human rights law and with the relevant standards that are applicable to the mandate of the working group, which Margarita already referred to at the beginning. No, so so uh, the, 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 the idea of this is to have a, a contradicting uh, views of, of, of the facts and, and of the case to see and to contrapose them and to see what what uh, comes out of this um, con opposition of views. Um, so so the, 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 the working group will give 60 days to the government to provide it with a response uh, to these allegations. Um, if the government for any reason, for example, COVID-19, but, but any other reason, um, needs more time to gather the information. Uh, the methods of work of the working group allows to uh, grant an additional 30 days extension. So in total, 90 days um, is the, the time frame that the, the, the government can use to elaborate a response and submit a response to the working group. And this includes uh, an opportunity to, to have an extension, but needs to be requested within the first 60 days of, of that time lapse. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, after receiving this re response from the government, uh, the working group will transmit it to the source, to the petitioner, to the complainant, um, so that it can provide a response to those um, comments and, and, and to those allegations made by the government. For example, um, if it could challenge uh, whether there was the, uh, uh, an arrest warrant produced or not, et cetera, or, or if the individual was taken before a judge, et cetera. So here you can really see how the opposing views are brought before the working group. And this is what it makes it really uh, interesting and, and a special procedure uh, within the UN because um, we, we aim at being a quasi-judicial process. It's, it's not a court. Uh, is, these are not judges, but they really imitate uh, the, the methodology to obtain um, the, the relevant information that is necessary to assess and analyze the case. So um, this is the ideal case scenario. However, if the government decides not to engage and not to respond, um, that's, that's also a scenario uh, that, that, is, that, that we foresee and, and that we deal with uh, in, in some cases. Uh, but that will not uh, prevent the working group to continue considering the case um, only with the information that it has managed to gather um, um, in the absence of, 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 of uh, a response from the government. What is important is that the, the government is granted an opportunity to defend itself and, and, and to, to really put forward um, the reasons why, uh, according to that government, that person uh, is detained. Um, next, please. So, um, when when we have, uh, let's say, substantiated the file and the, 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 we have all the information that, that, that we need, um, the working group could um, take these three different courses of action. It could find that the person is or was arbitrarily detained and therefore request the relief of the person, and not only that, but if there was an arbitrary detention, it's necessary to investigate why this happened, because this was a human rights violation, who was the, 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 the agent of the state that was responsible, or multiple agents of the state. There needs to be an investigation, and there needs to be uh, responsible and held accountable. Uh, there also needs to be reparations to the victim, because uh, as any human rights violation, uh, arbitrary detention needs to be uh, repaired. Uh, 
through compensation and, and other forms of reparation. Um, so the working group will uh, render uh, what it calls an opinion, uh, a legal uh, document, uh, official UN uh, with the logo and etc. Uh, in which, in this legal opinion, it will uh, encapsulate uh, all the elements of the case and the legal analysis, and will go this way towards finding or not whether the person is is is, is, is or was arbitrarily detained and and act in consequence asking and for the investigation and, and the reparations. However, if 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 the, the case brought before it uh, does not contain all the elements of, of arbitrary detention, although it's very rare because of the number of cases that we receive, it's common that those that are considered by the working groups are the ones that have all the elements of arbitrary detention, but it's also possible that during the uh, the, the, the the analysis of the case, given the response provided for by the government, etc., the working group could also find the, the, that there was no arbitrary detention or there is no arbitrary detention. Um, but also, it's possible that there is not enough information, even though it conducted the procedure and it needs to continue considering the case uh, in the future. So cases can, although rare, um, it has happened that cases are. Um, deferred in their consideration so that uh, the parties, the government and the petitioner can have an opportunity to provide further information so that more analysis can be done on that case and other issues can, can be reached in the future. So those are the, the, the three possibilities when, when the working group considers these individual cases. Uh, next, please. Now, um, it, 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 it is relevant to mention also um, I, I should have mentioned it earlier that uh, these opinions are adopted during sessions of the working group. So if, if, if you don't mind, don't pay attention to this slide right now, uh, just be reminded that the opinions, uh, the working group adopt these opinions in during sessions in the year. Uh, there are three sessions. So the members of the working group come together to Geneva to deliberate uh, and to analyze those cases. Obviously, during the pandemic, uh, the meetings were held online, but uh, it's relevant to, to point out that the opinions of the working group are adopted during periodic sessions, and there are three sessions uh, during the year. No? So that's how they, 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 they analyze the case. They come together and they each of them is responsible for the presenting a number of cases, and, and then they discuss uh, about them, and they adopt this opinion. Now, uh, now once the opinion is adopted, we we'll come back to this slide. Uh, and the, as I said, there is a it's a legal document with a legal analysis. It, it tries to uh, imitate uh, the structure of a, of a judicial ruling, basically, um, where where you have the facts, the legal analysis, and the disposition. Um, and, and then this this document is is transmitted to the government um, after 48 hours of of, of the government being notified, the, the the same document, the same opinion is transmitted to the petitioner, to the source. Um, it is worth notice to notice that this is not the finalized document. It's a it's a it's a advanced version of it. Um, but because the attention is a time sensitive issue, we we try to move forward with with the notification as soon as possible because um, we under the, the methods of work of, of our mandate. Under, uh, have this understanding that every 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 day in detention is 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 in arbitrary detention is is, is you know, unacceptable. So that's why an advanced uh, um, unedited version is is provided to the government to the source and then it's made public on the work group's website. However, this document goes through further uh, work because it goes to the, uh, an editorial section in the UN then goes to translation and then it's published in, in the UN official document system website in the six official languages and it's available uh, to the public um, with, with the details of the case, the, the, the response from the government, the allegations uh, by both parties, etc. So it's a very complete and very visible and official document. Uh, in addition, the working group of arbitrary, of arbitrary detention every year pre presents a report before the Human Rights Council, which includes details about all of these opinions that are adopted. So we report 
to to the to the Human Rights Council about these opinions. Um, as mentioned, they are available both in the working groups website, but also on the UN Official Document System website. Next, please. Now, um, it is really interesting not only to see how the process of adopting an opinion goes, but also what happens after uh, and what what is the effect of an opinion being adopted and and what are, what what we have seen uh, uh, in terms of the impact that we could have um, um, on each individual case. No, um, so. The, the, the working group has decided to to request um, uh, the governments and uh, and the sources to keep it informed within six months after the notification of the opinion, after the transmission of the opinion, um, if the person has been released, if there has been an investigation, if those agents that were responsible have been identified and held accountable, etc. Um, if 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 there has been compensation. Or, and other forms of reparation. Um, also, it is it is worth mentioning that these opinions, uh, once notified and transmitted to the parties, can be um, re reviewed by the working group. The government or, or the source can request a re review of the opinion, but only on the specific grounds that are well, well established on the methods of work, and, and those are when when first uh, the government has responded on time, it can request a, a, a review. If it has not responded, it cannot request a review. Uh, and and also the the request for review needs to be based on 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 facts that were not known at the time, or that are new to the case. Next slide, please. Now, when when I was mentioning that it's really useful, it's really interesting to see what happens after the adoption of, of the opinion. Uh, we have seen uh, sources being very creative in in their advocacy um, towards uh, increasing the pressure upon the governments to release individuals, and they use these these opinions um, for that. So it's uh, the opinions of the working group, even though they are not a judicial ruling, they are very useful tool for demonstrating and documenting arbitrary deprivation of liberty, not only in a particular case, uh, but also um, when you have multiple opinions and multiple cases adopted with regards to a particular topic or issue, region, country, in group of individuals, etc. It, it is also, also useful to identify patterns uh, and structural issues. Um, then. Um, these, these opinions are also often brought before national courts um, to, to request the release of, of the individuals to the judge. Um, but also we have seen press conferences, events, books uh, being made after opinions uh, of the working group uh, and cases that we have um, um, decided, but not we, the working group has decided. Um, ideally, obviously, what we aim is to, to achieve is, is the release of, of of the person that is under arbitrary detention, and 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 the um, the measures being adopted by by the government to correct the situation, to hold accountable those responsible, and and to prevent this type of violations from happening in the future. But um, it's not always the same uh, outcome uh, for every case. I, I will leave you until here. Thank you so much for, for your attention again, and I will now give the floor back to, to Margarita. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Loana. I will uh, wrap up our presentation quickly so as to give some time also for Q&A. I see um, some you know, activity in the chat box. Thank you so much for all your questions. But just quickly uh, to touch upon uh, some of the issues that might interest you that we've been uh, made aware of. Firstly, uh, the conditions of detention, including the conditions of uh, detention of migrants. So the working group is not mandated per se to assess condition of detention. However, uh, it uh, may note conditions both in country mission reports or in its legal opinions. If these conditions, for example, impede the ability 
of a regular review of detention in the context of migration or the conditions violate international standards uh, requiring the respect for dignity of the uh, persons deprived of liberty. Um, in the, when the working group detects that the uh, conditions are falling be, uh, be below the standards, they um, the working group would normally, in its opinions, make a direct reference uh, of the case to the special rapporteur uh, on torture, or for example, to special rapporteur on the rights of migrants. So that would be uh, the official uh, reference uh, to the attention of other special procedures. Um, and if you consult the deliberation number five uh, on uh, the arbitrary detention in context of migration, this deliberation specifically notes that the administrative detention of uh, migrants in the context of mig migration must not carry a punitive uh, character, so it must conform to certain standards and conditions. Then um, the question of the necessity and the length of detention of asylum seekers. Um, the working group is guided by the principle that uh, the detention must be absolutely the exceptional measure and uh, also for the shortest period possible. And it should also be justified by a legitimate purpose, such as, for example, a processing or recording a claim or documenting an, uh, documenting an entry. So um, um, that that's the guiding principle. And the second element is that uh, it uh, should be uh, approved by uh, uh, judicial authority and regularly reviewed. So there should be a mechanism for regular review. And uh, in um, uh, authority should be also guided by, of course, the principle that it's, it's exceptional and uh, always seek alternative to detention in the community. So I would also refer, refer you to deliberation number five, and uh, you will also see the link to um, uh, opinions, ju jurisprudence of the working group uh, that concerns specific, uh, specific context of uh, immigration detention. And uh, I think that's a uh, link to that uh, opinion uh, on Australia. Uh, where, uh, in this context, the working group has found that the detention is arbitrary because it lacks absolutely the le legal purpose and there is no uh, regular review mechanism in this case, so it's de facto indefinite. Next slide, please. So I think that's our last slide. Um, detention of child asylum seekers. So um, actually the working group has considered this issue very closely Mm, during uh, its uh, country visit to Greece uh, that was uh, not that long ago, in December uh, 2019. Uh, if you refer to the report, which uh, is hyperlinked, uh, you will see uh, that, uh, you know, the working group has considered questions of age assessment and uh, protective custody of the minors uh, asylum seekers. Uh, but uh, obviously it's guided itself by, by the principle that state should prioritize best interest of a child and um, including the children that enter its territory in irregular manner. Uh, and it must ensure that they are not detained uh, and they are placed in facilities appropriate to their age. If you would uh, consult the country visit report, you would find that uh, the working group has seen unfortunate instances where children, um, asylum seekers have been held in police stations, which are obviously not appropriate facilities for 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 their for for, for them to be. The detention of stateless persons, um, the working group would consider that uh, non-nationals, uh, including um, you know, stateless persons, um, in any deprivation uh, situation of deprivation of liberty shall be guaranteed access to a court of law, uh, empowered to order immediate release, so that they basically should have a right to review the legality of their detention. And um, also the deliberation number five uh, highlights that the migration detention policies and procedures must not be discriminatory 
or make distinctions based on legal conditions of the person. So they should not uh, discriminate whether the person is uh, stateless or not. And finally, uh, on the issue of access to immigration detention, uh, I think that's uh, one of the fundamental questions of fair, fair uh, trial standards and guarantees. Um, the working group is uh, guided by by the principle and standard that migrant detainees must enjoy the same rights as those detained in criminal justice or other administrative context, including the right to legal representation, contact with family, interpreters. I've as I've already mentioned, and consular assistance. I think um, so the right uh, to access the detention of these categories of people um, is also very much scrutinized, for example, during the country visits of, of the working group. So I think that's uh, it from our part. I'm sorry we've uh, taken a little bit longer than we expected, but um, I hope we can uh, engage uh, closely in our Q&A and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Margarita, Luana and Francisco. This has been very informative. Can I ask colleagues who are online if you can raise your hand if you learned something new today in this presentation or you can put an emoticon or you can put any reaction. Was there something new that uh, I see? Yes, uh, some hands coming up. Uh, uh, if there was a small new element for you today, did you learn something today? Oh, fantastic. I see a lot of colleagues uh, raising, also giving hands up. Uh, thank you, Benedict and others. Wow, fantastic. Very informative. You see the feedback. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, this is very useful. You can put your hands uh, down, but it was a useful feedback. So um, we heard how the working group is uh, functioning, what are the different possibilities of engagement from individual cases uh, during uh, the country visits, uh, thematic reports and beyond. Peter has been very helpfully putting in the chat uh, the different resources, links as colleagues were speaking. So you have all the different sources uh, available in the chat so you can refer to them and uh, uh, go more into details. But we have uh, a lot of questions, so let me go immediately to them and I will bring them back to Margarita, Loana and Francisco and you can take them, uh, distribute between yourself as you deem best fit. But very interesting questions and in no particular order, um, um, colleagues would be interested if uh, um, how do so I start with one topic. In case the countries uh, did not ratify any relevant legal instruments, how do you interact with the government? So uh, what is your basis uh, for this discussion and exchanges? But also if the detention is uh, done by non-recognized authorities or non-state armed groups uh, um, that are um, um, on part of the uh, territory of a state, do you also communicate with them or only with uh, government counterparts? So this would be and the second question, but going forward, are you also monitoring conditions in detention during your country visits. Is this uh, part of your mandate or what you do when you go to countries? And not only when do you conduct country visits, but also are you open to receive in confidential manner uh, information on the conditions in detention by various sources? Is that something that you are following up on as well? Colleagues were also interested uh, if the working group is intervening in amicus curiae uh, cases, if this is uh, part of your mandate and if you have some examples. But what happens also when um, um, the legal opinion is uh, contradicting or not aligned with the national 
uh, opinion that is issued. So uh, when the national authorities are contesting it or how do you actually follow up with the authorities uh, when also mm, you issue uh, an opinion? Uh, how is the working group engaged? Does it stop when you issue the opinion or is there something afterwards? Uh, how do you follow up? What if the government is not responding or the situation does not improve? Uh, is there any role of the working group? Um, following up on the prolonged administrative custody, what is the definition of prolonged? If you can go a little bit more into the definition. Um, and how do you deal with situations when the argument of the government counterparts or authorities um, are that they have not enough capacity, not enough human resources, resources, uh, financial resources. So they say we would like to deal with it, but actually we have uh, there is willingness, but not the capacity. How do you deal with uh, such situations? Uh, so uh, this is the first set of questions, uh, but we also had two questions in terms of uh, uh, collaboration of ne with national human rights institutions, commissions. If you have some examples of collaboration uh, with them. And finally, uh, from Stefania, uh, whether you are also tackling uh, uh, the case of, of stateless persons, if the working group has worked uh, on cases related to stateless persons. So we heard, of course, uh, in the context of migration, asylum seekers, uh, refugees, mm, but uh, this goes beyond uh, to stateless persons. So those are uh, the questions that I uh, gathered from the chat. Let us uh, start with those and I see that we have more questions coming in, but we will have them in the second round. So over to you, uh, colleagues, and uh, we take it from here. Fran, do you want to start uh, in regards to uh, the first uh, set of questions on, on uh, uh, what happens when the state has not ratified specific instrument and what happens when uh, we deal with a non-state entity, non-recognized non entity on the territory of the state? Sure, thank you. I'll take uh, from there. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, so basically to answer the first question, uh, if the state has not ratified the relevant uh, covenants or, or treaties, um, the working group will rely on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is, um, let's say, not subject to signature accession of ratification. It's it's a uh, it's part of the UN uh, uh, customary international law, um, so it's considered to be uh, binding upon all UN member states, basically. Um, so that's the, the, the then the first. Um, uh, the, the answer to the first question, uh, also the, the, the jurisprudence of the working group and all the sources of law uh, are relevant and, and often considered. Um, um, for example, what has the um, um, International Court of Justice um, established in terms of, for example, procedure. It helps us, us to inform our procedure, uh, fair trial, etc. So um, that's that's the first question. Then if 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 the detention is by a non-state actor, the, the, the working group will normally engage only with states um, uh, different to other special procedures who will uh, also be willing to engage with, let's say, companies or uh, non-state uh, armed groups. Um, the, the working group has a different, uh, a little bit uh, more careful approach to this. Um, it will go through the government concerned and um, especially if, if that government is, uh, is occupying power in, in another uh, territory, but but no, uh, it's 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 um, for, for the opinions and, and the procedure to be uh, effective, to have some sort of possibility of success, it needs to be through the permanent missions in Geneva of those governments. So those are the channels that we use. Um, I cannot recall an example in which the working group has adopted an opinion on uh, detention of an individual by a non-state actor in which the government uh, that is relevant to that territory, to that individual or to that non-state actor is, is 
it's not it's not it's not part of the procedure. The governor will be always the counterpart of 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 the petitioner and of the source. Uh, that's it. No, the yeah. Thank you, Fran. Perhaps I could uh, address a couple of uh, other questions that I noted, and um, if we miss something, maybe Luana could also. And, um, I would like to uh, address the question on the monitoring of conditions of detention uh, during the country visits. Uh, well, uh, the working group has no direct mandate per se, unlike uh, the Committee Against Torture. Uh, to monitor such conditions, uh, but however, uh, having said that, of course, uh, these would be reflected in the report uh, if the conditions are substandard or, you know, this would be um, noted. Uh, uh, as violating Nelson Mandela rules, for example, uh, as uh, impeding uh, the uh, ability of the detainees to to defend themselves. Uh, and prepare for their defense effectively also. Um, and uh, the working group would uh, bring uh, these uh, to the attention of the relevant mandate holders of special procedures. I am um, mostly um, referring to the special rapporteur on torture, but also the special rapporteur on health among other like most prominent mandates. Whether we uh, are open to confidentially receive submissions on conditions, I think, of course, the working group would welcome all the submissions, but I think this would be uh, most uh, effectively channeled to the uh, Committee Against Torture in uh, in this respect, because they, they would uh, have at their disposal more mechanisms to act and let's not forget that the working group can only visit a country upon official invitation of the government, which not, might not necessarily be the case with uh, you know, the Committee Against Torture. Um, what uh, the other question I think concerns uh, um, the um, discrepancy between the national legislation and the working group's disposition. So I you know, when I was uh, listening to this uh, question, I immediately um, I remembered the uh, the China jurisprudence on China. I, I must mention that I'm the focal point for Asia Pacific, so uh, China uh, figures quite prominently in our case uh, law. Case load. So this is very often the case when uh, um, the uh, the working group finds that the national legislation is overly broad or uh, overly not specific enough so to embody all kinds of offenses uh, uh, and basically justify the detention. The government would uh, normally revert to us saying that everything has been conducted in accordance to with law, most, most like, uh, notably Article 105 of the Criminal Procedure Code, but uh, the working group has found consistently that it's overly broad, it does not uh, have a specific uh, legal certainty, and uh, in these instances, I, I mentioned China, but it can happen in all kinds of like in, uh, in the context of Vietnam, I recall. That's been uh, also the case if you look at the Vietnamese jurisprudence of the working group. But the working group would uh, consistently call if it sees really a pattern of, of uh, cases that evoke the same article that is uh, basically inconsistent with uh, the international norms, the working group would call for the government to uh, amend the national legislation and bring it in, in conformity with the inter international legal obligations or if uh, the state is not a state party to the ICCPR to bring it into um, uh, the to bring it into, uh, in, the, in the general standard of the international uh, human rights uh, legal framework. 
Um, and the last question that I noted was the definition of uh, prolonged. What is a prolonged detention? And uh, what happens when the government says that they don't have enough capacity? And uh, if you look at the working group's deliberation number five, again, the working group states that the detention must be absolutely exceptional and for the shortest possible time. So there, there is no as such a threshold like beyond like three months, it's too much, but the working group would look into whether, you know, there have been, there have been really a uh, legal necessity, security, national security, like the, 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 um, the security of the community, I beg your pardon, or um, whether there has been uh, a, any alternative sought uh to to the uh migration detention or uh and whether uh this uh detention is being uh regularly reviewed and uh if um you know in most of the cases when the working group has found that the detention is arbitrary in the migration context uh uh the the major violation is basically either that the detention is automatic or whether there is absolutely no possibility of meaningful uh, review of uh, the continued detention. And uh, in cases when the government comes back to, to, to the working group saying that they don't have enough uh, resources, the working group would all, always, I think, point out to the fact that the detention must be absolutely exceptional and uh, as a starting point, alternatives uh, to, to admin, administrative detention must be sought, for, such as, for example, placement in the community. So. I think resources is not really uh, a good enough uh, reason <laughs> to to quote from the government. Uh, I'm sure I missed uh, some of the questions. I don't know if uh, Loana has noted and would like to address some some others. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Margarita. So I noted a question about whether the working group would join an amicus curiae and. Um, we have not done so many times, if uh, I'm not mistaken. I think the first time was in 2020, uh, where we joined with uh, the working group um, on, uh, I cannot remember, it was with another working group. Uh, it was um, the working group on discrimination against women and girls. Uh, so we haven't done so many times, but it has happened. Uh, and this concerns the detention of multiple women, um, and we drafted that uh, amicus here to the government. Um, but again, it, it's not something that we have done very, very fre frequently. In addition, uh, I noted a question about the follow-up information. So. Um, again, we, I think we mentioned this, but the, we try to gather information, follow up information from the source as well as the government. So the source will come back to us, uh, get, generally giving us information about the follow up procedure. As Francisco mentioned in the opinions, there is a request for follow up procedures from the government uh, and the source asking us to inform us about um, different measures that have been uh, recommended by the working group and their implementation. Um, the the follow up will be um, or the these measures that are implemented will be shared in the annual report of the working group. Um, in I, there was a question about uh, the receiving um, no sorry stateless persons uh, and uh, so I think that one thing that we didn't mention that uh, that may be necessary is that of course the working group doesn't work just with nationals or doesn't just um, decide on the detention of nationals of the country so any person that is detained by the government uh, may be the subject of an opinion whether that person is a national of that country or not. So we have many cases in which the person is not a national of the country, uh, but we still rule on the arbitrary uh, nature of the detention. I think that's all the questions I noted. Um, 
forgive me if there's some missing, Valerie. Um, we yeah, might revert back to yeah. I think Thanks. there was a question on the National Human Rights Institutions. Uh, Yes, and uh, just to quickly uh, to touch to touch on it, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the working group uh, has, uh, you know, uh, been uh, collaborating with the national human rights institutions in uh, many contexts, uh, most notably uh, during uh, the country visits of of the mandate. Uh, but also uh, national human rights institutions are uh, encouraged and can be, in fact, one of the sources of, of the petitions. So um, I know that uh, it was noted that the national human rights institutions are recording a large number of violations. They, they can absolutely be um, initiating the regular communication procedure. Uh, in uh, before the working group also as a, as an official source and of course that would be kept confidential sorry valerie i think you're muted thank you so much colleagues thanks to loana francisco and margarita for those elements of response i think we tackled uh, most of the questions which is great and thanks liliana for also pointing out that of course when colleagues uh, speak about migration this is for you OHCHR in the broader sense so um, this encompasses uh, also refugees asylum seekers uh, and um, of course the terminology is uh, slightly different but uh, we understand the work that the working group on arbitrary detention is tackling cases uh, or of persons uh, under UNHCR mandate or in situation of displacement as well as statelessness. Um, I see a few other um, questions, so I will put them back. But colleagues, if we have not uh, fully answered your question or if you feel that uh, you would like to know more or um, share also an example of Mm, or practice or um, further uh, question, please, you can also raise your hand. And thanks to Mary, who has been uh, like the biggest champion uh, today uh, in uh, asking questions. Indeed, a very relevant topic, but also uh, Margarita, Luana and Francisco, if uh, you could share with us whether the working group uh, is issuing interim measures. Uh, if this is part of your um, mandate and if there needs to be um, a kind of a repetitive pattern. So there was a question if, for example, you intervene, if it's a multiple case of detention or you can intervene when it's the first case of a detention, if you can clarify that aspect uh, and uh, if um, of course, we understood that you uh, tackle individual cases, but you can also uh, act on some kind of patterns or um, situations in a broader sense without referring to individual cases. So those would be uh, the questions well noted on the point, Margarita, you uh, put forward that it's important to think broader as well um, to connect with other special procedures or um, committees, uh, you mentioned torture, CAT and others. So it's just a reminder for all of us colleagues that one situation does not have necessarily one uh, line or solution or uh, interlocutor. It's a complex um, environment. The more uh, synergies we have, the the more comprehensively we can tackle uh, the issue. But let me go back to uh, Margarita, Luana and Francisco with those uh, additional few questions and any final remarks. And at the meantime, colleagues, if you would like to come uh, with any example of further question or please uh, put up your hand and I will come back to you before closing. So over to you, Margarita, Luana and Francisco, please. Colleagues, do you want me to take these ones? Yes, uh, sure. So I also wanted to take it because because I wanted to make a couple of comments in relation to the previous uh, batch of questions. Uh, there was a question about whether if, if the if the opinion is incompatible with a judicial ruling on national courts. 
I know my colleagues address follow up, but but I, I just want to say that um, it, it is a general principle and, and a norm of international law that, that states cannot oppose national legislation or national system to not to comply with their international obligations. Um, so so the, the 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 sentence or, or, or the national ruling could perhaps uh, be based on national law. That is, that national law is not compatible with international law, but also uh, the the sentence itself could be incompatible with the international obligations of the state. Um, so that that we have seen cases in which uh, judicial rulings from national courts challenges. Uh, the, the authority of the working group or the legitimacy or, or, or legal validity of our opinions is not strange, but it's part of the constant, you know, um, the effort that, 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 that we all do towards the release of individuals. And we use the tools that we have at, at our disposal. And um, then the, the, the other question was, uh, what if, uh, if the government cannot have the capacity to cooperate with the working group? Uh, because let's say, for example, f financial uh, constraints, and uh, to to that, I just wanted to add that you know having a person detained is more expensive than not having that person detained, and with you, when you have an over overcrowded system, it's even more. Um, so we have seen, for example, uh, that many issues of overcrowding uh, can be released, uh, can be addressed, looking at alternatives to detention for not violent offences. Uh, often the uh, detention places of detention are are full of people that are there uh, for minor offenses, uh, f uh, waiting for trial, um, without being convicted. Uh, in, in, so, so you know, that's if, if if the government really wants to cooperate, looking into alternatives to detention is is the best way to alleviate its capacity to cooperate further. So, so I I wanted to add those those two things. Then to the question of interim measures, um, it's true that the working group has the capacity or the, the tool, not only of adopting opinions, but also sending what we call urgent actions or urgent appeals to government. Uh, but because of the high amount of cases that we're dealing with, it is very strange that the working group will deal with a case through both procedures. Uh, it is true that the opinions take a little bit longer, but not too much, and also, when we request information to the government at the start of the procedure to adopt an opinion, the working group uh, will normally include uh, in that communication a request uh, for the government to safeguard uh, the life, uh, integrity, uh, and rights of the person that is under custody. So um, even though we don't have a formal interim measure procedure, we, we, when we start the process for the adoption of an opinion, we request the government uh, this, this protection element. Uh, and also, in very rare ca cases, in extreme circumstances, there is the possibility of sending, uh, in parallel, an urgent action to the government uh, on a case that is being decided, will be decided, or um, or has been decided. Um, but we are very careful with that because uh, the working group should not advance a conclusion about the, the merits of the case when requesting uh, measures to be adopted to, to safeguard the, the lives and integrity of, of the individual. And then there, there was a question about uh, how many times a person needs to be detained for the working group to intervene or, or what happens when there have been multiple instances of detention. You know, it's very difficult to give a general answer to all cases because each case is, is, is different. There are countries in which, for example, we see patterns of short-term detention. It's not, you know, a person being convicted to 10 years in, uh, detention, but, but but it's a person that, for example, there was a demonstration that day and the person was detained that day to prevent uh, he or she from attending that demonstration. Um, obviously, the working group, uh, with the huge amount of cases that it has, it cannot has the time. It is impossible to deal with a short-term detention uh, before it it ends. So um, the the longer the detention is, the more opportunities the the working group will have to engage with the government and and to and to push um, for the case. But also, if we see patterns of individuals that are always being detained, uh, there is also the possibility for the working group to take to take those cases. 
Thank you so much, Francisco. This has been uh, very useful and indeed I think you have responded to to the questions uh, of colleagues and to beyond. I don't see any hands up at this moment from participants. Um, Luana, Margarita, anything to add before we come to the close of our webinar? Not from my side, no. I just like to thank uh, again everyone for for attending and for your interest in our mandate and we really hope that uh, you know the mechanisms uh, that are available uh, to the working group could uh, serve, could be useful either to to you or to your partners on the ground in um, uh, in safeguarding the rights of uh, individuals on the ground. Thank you. Luana? Uh, I was just, if I may, going to add, because I saw, I think you mentioned something about uh, what would happen if the person was released in the meantime before the person, before the working group was able to take, to adopt an opinion. And so I just wanted to uh, make that clarification that uh, the, the working group may carry on with adopting an opinion even if the person has been released. And in fact, it has happened that the person either has been released before we even send the communication to the government or after or um, in between. Uh, so before, after the communication is sent, but before the uh, adoption of the opinion. And in part that is true because uh, beyond just asking for the release of the person, we also would uh, ask the government for uh, reparations or compensation of the person. And so uh, nothing prevents the working group from uh, making that um, determination even if the person was released. And apart from that, thank you very much as well. Thank you, Valerie, for organizing it and everyone for attending and giving us your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Loana, Margarita, Francisco, for your time and uh, sharing your expertise and knowledge with us and also making the connection with colleagues who are online colleagues. We would encourage you if you have any further questions or ideas or maybe you are thinking, I have a case or a situation. I'm not sure whether I should reach out to the working group if it's the right mechanism. Please don't hesitate. Also, you can reach out to me, Peter or we can put you in touch with the working group uh, and uh, definitely um, it's worth also to have this uh, brainstorming and um, try to see how to more actively engage with the working group on arbitrary detention. Of course, not to say that all you do on arbitrary detention or detention more broadly will only be dealt with the working group. You do a lot of other elements in terms of your protection monitoring, in terms of your advocacy, with the government, revisions of legal frameworks, you do a lot, but the working group can actually support those efforts, can complement them, uh, can uh, um, support uh, the key messages, the, F, um, the um, efforts you are doing on the ground, but also raise it to another level beyond what uh, we can do uh, at our level. Margarita. Thank you, Valerie. I just like to echo uh, your statement that, in fact, yes, the working group can uh, support uh, your advocacy efforts in so far, for example, as uh, um, exemplifying a specific pattern of a violation with a specific emblematic case. So if uh, you see in your operational context a specific pattern, I think that would be um, might be interesting for for you and for all the uh, alleged victims to 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 have a, a one or two opinions of the working group highlighting this pattern, which uh, then, uh, as my colleagues explained, uh, would be translated into the official UN report and uh, thus documented officially. So I think that would be also um, a useful way for the working group to support support you uh, on the ground, not only a uh, specific victim, but also to support your advocacy and your work on the ground. So thank you. 
Thank you so much. Uh, so we are at the end of our session, dear colleagues. Uh, just to flag to you that we have two upcoming thematic webinars. On 7th of April, uh, there will be a discussion around human rights education. And then on 12th of April, please mark it down on uh, your agendas as a save the date, which you will receive. We will launch our um, uh, good practice guide. So examples collected from all regions on a, what has been the impact of engagement with human rights mechanisms, be it special procedures, treaty bodies, UPR, how it has resulted in positive impact and hopefully uh, giving you also some further inspiration and ideas. Um, how to take it forward. So two themes that are coming up, uh, but thank you again very much. I see the reactions in the chat very much appreciated. Thanks to all colleagues who also asked the questions and uh, we will be in touch and have a good day. Over.